Hi, and welcome to my presentation. I'll tell you a bit about my project called Chimera Linux. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Daniel Kolesa, I'm a developer at Igalia on the WebKit team. I've been contributing to free and open source software since 2007. Since 2009, I've also been using FreeBSD. I currently maintain support for the power architecture at Void Linux. In my free time, I do game development, but that's sort of a minor thing for me. But what is Chimera Linux? Well, it's a new Linux distribution which might not sound very exciting by itself, but it was created completely from scratch with a free BSD based user land, which should be pretty interesting by itself. It's also fully built with LVM Clang toolchain. As far as uh, the C library goes, the robust muscle libc project is used. The whole project follows the rolling release model, which is not to really achieve, uh, you know, bleeding edge software like uh, many rolling distributions do. It's more like to simplify the release management of the whole project, make things easier for myself. Since uh, I currently maintain the whole thing by myself, I don't really want to have to cut several releases and support them and uh, take care of rebuilding the whole repo every time and so on. Uh, I mean, this also has some disadvantages, uh, particularly you cannot really rebuild the whole system without incrementing every single revision number, but uh, that's a minor trade-off I'm willing to take. The whole project is supposed to be highly portable and has several tiers of uh, supported CPU architectures, with the first tier featuring the PowerPC 64-bit Little Indian, Arch 64, as well as x86-64. Uh, the second tier features RISC-V 64-bit and the third tier has 64-bit PowerPC Big Endian. It does not really mean the distribution only really aims to support 64-bit architectures, it's just that these are what's primarily interesting for the project right now, and if there's enough demand, more stuff may be added later. The project is supposed to be bootstrappable, so that you can compile it from source in uh, different kinds of environments. This doesn't really mean bootstrapping in the same sense as in bringing up from uh, complete nothing. It's more about the practical side of things, to be able to compile the system from source you know, in different places, if it's possible or if it's needed to actually compile it from scratch uh, without uh, having Chimera present. That's what you can do. There's a custom source package build system which generates binary packages for you. You can then install those binary packages on your system. For binary packages we use APK Tools, which is a lightweight package manager created for Alpine Linux. For service management, the system called Dinit is used, which hasn't been deployed in any other distribution as far as I know. It's, uh, it's been around for a while, but it's not very well known. I like it because it's uh, lightweight, but still has a good trade-off between uh, features and uh, you know complexity. It's dependency-based, it's supervising, uh, so that those are some basic requirements I have when it comes to service management. It's a general purpose system with a graphical desktop, but you can really deploy it in any place, uh, container, servers, it, it's up to you. Um, it does deploy a number of uh, modern technologies, including Wayland and Pipewire. The, there is a repository which is split into several components. The main component contains a sort of a default set of software plus the core things required for boot. It also is supposed to provide uh, some good defaults uh, for more advanced applications, uh, while the contrary repository provides uh, sort of uh, other things which uh, are not really supposed to be part of main. There's other repositories too. There's a non-free which would contain things which would not be redistributable. And there's also experimental which uh, is sort of a staging area uh, before things go to into main or contrib. The system tries to avoid legacy stuff when possible. And this is not only when it comes to software, only also when it comes to other things. For example, 
Uh, system fonts are by default shipped in uh, the OpenType format, which uh, allows us to have uh, really nice font rendering thanks to the Adobe CFF Rasterizer and FreeType. What are my motivations for the project? Well, as many open source projects, uh, I wanted to have some fun at first and start a community. Uh, I wanted to explore alternatives for common things in the Linux stack and while at it increase the diversity in the whole stack. There's a lot of software which uh, is specific to Linux which makes uh, some assumptions about uh, your user land. I wanted to get rid of these assumptions as much as possible and to make sure that uh, software portability is improved uh, across the whole stack. Also, I wanted to make a distribution that I would be personally happy with using. I am reasonably happy using what I'm using right now, but things can always be better and why not? Also, to learn from uh, mistakes of other distributions and to fix these. A minor goal has been to prove that Linux is not GNU Linux. Chimera does not require any GNU components other than GNU make to actually build. And it does not require any to actually boot either. Well, that, that is up to you because the system does package a number of GNU components. I do not have anything against GNU or the GPL. It's uh, more like uh, to approach things from the alternatives providing standpoint. I think LVM is also a great toolchain which enables us to do things which we couldn't do with GCC. It has a great support for sanitizers as well as things like control flow integrity which I would like to enable at some point. It has actually usable link time optimization called FinLTO which unlike classical LTO scales across multiple cores and has much lower demands on uh, system resources. That means it can actually be deployed system-wide even for large projects such as WebKit which would otherwise consume many tens of gigabytes of memory with classical LTO used and sometimes wouldn't even compile at all because you would run out of memory. LVM also has a really good support for cross-compiling which I will describe later. Now, system principles. It's explicitly not a minimalist or suckless kind of distribution. I think this kind of labeling is really vague and not really helpful in most cases. It's not a reactionary or traditionalist kind of project. You know, you see these every once in a while, thinking things were okay 10 years ago, let's restore how things were 10 years ago. I do not think things were okay 10 years ago. I think systemd did bring some uh, much needed change into the stack. While I might not agree with all technical choices in systemd and I do not use systemd in this project, I think it's fine to take inspiration when, when it's a good thing. If something is bad, of course, I get rid of it, uh, but still, systemd is not the root of all evil, should not be treated as such. However, technical debt is a really bad thing, and the system aims to prevent it uh, by default if possible. This is done by enforcing best practices, for example, in the build system. There should usually be one obvious way to do things. This is not really to limit to user choice, uh, there should still be choice, but uh, there should be some good default for most people who do not really care about choosing. Uh, well, it should also be self-sustaining, the tooling should be resilient uh, and maintainable. Uh, I think it's important not to run into things like, you know, depending on some 10 years old version of some tool, which in the meantime broke API two times and there's nothing we could do about it at that point. Uh, it's best to avoid these things and have self-contained uh, uh, simple, simple tooling, which can be deployed on any computer and easily used. Portability is definitely not a joke and neither is bootstrapping as I already mentioned previously. The system takes special care to avoid writing complex things in shell because I think it, this frequently results in maintenance nightmare, especially later on. I think good things should be easy to do and bad things should be a pain. The whole system should be built around these principles to make sure that people intuitively do the right thing and do not do the stuff they shouldn't do. Also, documentation is very important and as many open source projects, this one is also lacking in this regard for now, but uh, I hope this will improve in short to medium term. 
I think having strong opinions for development is a good thing. It gives the project a sense of direction and uh, also I believe even more important is fun environment, which is sometimes hard to achieve, but I think having a good community is a good start for that. Uh, you can be self-motivated in the short term. This happens, this works for some people. For some people it works for longer than for others. But in the long term you really need a good community around the project. Otherwise you will get demotivated uh, real fast. I think technical only spaces and projects which advertise meritocracy and so on usually do not do the thing they think they are doing. And I try to avoid this. So I think uh, the environment should be fun and everyone should be welcome. As for early history of the project, I started the idea around 2015. It was a simple idea of Linux with BSD user land. The development then started a few years later. In the meantime, I've been thinking about it and getting some ideas and occasionally came across something, but uh, I never really got to do any real work on this until May 2021. In early June, however, I already had a first working prototype. It had a bit under 50 templates and at this point it was still using GCC and GNU userland. It was also using the XBPS package manager from Void Linux. The, the early prototype was a reimagination of the XBPS SRC system from Void, which is a similar system but uh, unlike uh, ours it's written completely in shell and has a number of drawbacks that I wanted to avoid. That's why I was redesigning it. It became Seaports, which uh, has the port's name, but it's not exactly like, uh, for example, FreeBSD ports. It shares a number of concepts, uh, but uh, it really is its own thing. It has an integrated build system, which means if you want to actually build things, all you have to do is uh, clone the Git repository of Seaports and you can invoke the build system directly from itself. The system is written in Python and package templates are also just Python scripts. Python is used in a way which uh, ensures that uh, the template syntax is simple enough that even people who do not really program can understand it. I think Python is a well-suited language for this. I wanted to avoid inventing a completely new DSL because that would mean more code, more debugging, more bugs, you know. And I wanted to make this thing as simple as possible. It's also designed to be very fast with a little to no build system overhead. Uh, if you want a specific example, if you compare building the muscle ellipse in XPPSSRC and in CBuild, it only takes about 9 seconds on my machine in CBuild. In XBPSSRC it takes way more than 20 seconds. If you compare the CPU time utilization during both builds, you will see that it's actually about the same, it's just that uh, XBPSSRC just spends a lot of more time waiting around and doing nothing. This is uh, the inherent overhead of the shell and uh, there's nothing much that can be done about it, uh, except uh, writing things in a real language. Both systems use Linux namespaces for sandboxing, which means you can run them in a fully unprivileged manner. In fact, it is not possible to run Seabuild as root. It will just reject you because there's no reasonable way to manage user namespaces as root. This is what a template for Seabuild looks like. This is a modern template, not uh, like it was when things started. And if you cannot read the small font, that's okay. The stream resolution might not be the highest. Uh, you can always grab the PDF and take a look later. In any case, first steps after having the prototype were to drop core utils and related software. I found this nice project called BSD Utils, which was aiming to port free BSD tools to Linux. At that point it was sort of bare and semi-functional, so the first thing to do was to help port those remaining tools and reach parity with core utils. After this I also added some uh, new ports of new tools which are not covered by core utils. This includes things like diff, grab, sad, you know, those things which are provided by other GNU packages. As far as porting BSD tools goes, the code is surprisingly clean and portable and it was a really nice experience to actually port it to Linux. There's a few BSD quirks which are shared between uh, most of the tools. 
Since they are shared, it means you have to write some portability layer just once and actually use it in all of these tools. One thing I regularly ran into was the lack of the reg start and extension in Muscle's regular expression library. This is not a standard thing because the POSIX does not specify it. <coughs> However, <coughs> it is used in FreeBSD and it is also provided in glibc. When it comes to muscle porting, I replaced it uh, with uh, not using the extension, but just by using a separate buffer when needed and so on. And there was also the tail tool, which was using the KQ event handling mechanism. Uh, in Linux, there's, there's no KQ because that's API specific to the BSDs and macOS. But you have a number of other APIs which together make up equivalent functionality. In this case, this API was used to monitor files for changes. I just replaced it with Linux iNotify API, which more or less provides the same thing. Otherwise, it was a pretty uneventful port. Now let's take a look at dropping XBPS. The original plan was to use the FreeBSD packaging system. This turned out not really ready for our use, but uh, we replaced it with Alpine Linux APK, which turned out to be a great fit. Why was not FreeBSD package manager ready? Because for one it required a port to muscle, which I did and it was actually compiling and working, but there's a few components in the package manager which, uh, uh, which make it not suitable for this project, such as the dependency handling mechanism being incomplete currently, and also the shared library scanner is fully integrated and not really working in the way we want it to work with, uh, with the C-Build system. So uh, I ended up using APK and it worked fine. It was really quick to integrate and by mid-July I had a completely robust and complete system. The package generation code, that is the code which actually creates the package files, is completely custom and does not depend on APK. That is because uh, in the current version uh, APK files are just tarballs. So I could use native Python tarball module to generate them. Uh, while uh, those tarballs are not completely plain, they contain some PAX metadata containing, say, say file checksums and so on. Uh, this is possible to handle through Python star file module and it works okay. By mid-June the GNU user land was actually mostly gone, but it was still using GCC and for the time being XBPS. By late, late mid-June, after I added the initial code for APK generation, I was focusing on getting rid of these, and by late June, both XBPS and CoreUtils were removed from the distribution. But why is APK used? Well, it's lightweight, but also surprisingly elegant and uh, fully featured. It has a nice restricted dependency solver, which is constraint-based, and it's also fully transactional. It supports features which we use extensively, such as uh, triggers and advanced virtual packages, which are also repurposed for tracking so names in a really nice way. But about uh, GCC removal. Well, dropping GCC was by itself a fairly easy thing, because not, not much was packaged at this point, and it was mostly about adding a standard build of LLVM. Then, uh, of course, I had to tell it to use its own runtime instead of GCC's. This is uh, important at the bootstrap stage because in most Linux distros, when you compile binaries with Clang, you want them to be compatible with those compiled by GCC, which is the system compiler. Well, GCC provides some core runtimes and therefore by default LVM also uses these runtimes. It provides its own runtimes, but they are not used on Linux uh, because of those other distributions. So we just tell LVM to use its own runtime and after the bootstrap is done, or the first stage of the bootstrap is done, there is no, no longer a need to do anything because the GCC runtime is just not present in the first place, so LVM will just pick up what it has. In any case, after in integrating LVM, I had to recompile everything with uh, LVM and fix those few errors that uh, came up. I was expecting more errors to come up, but uh, there were surprisingly few. Finally, I removed the GCC packaging entirely. 
GCC might get reintroduced into the repo at some uh, later point, much in the future, uh, as a, a thing for users to actually use separately from the distribution. But I do not have any plans to actually compile anything with GCC. Now let's get to cross-compiling. In order to describe how cross-compiling with LLVM differs, I'll first describe how it works with GCC. To understand cross-compiling in general, you need to know what a triplet is and what a cross toolchain is. Well, a triplet, as its name suggests, is sort of a string which has three components. The first component is the architecture, then you have the vendor component, and then you have the OS environment component. So a triplet, for example, looks like x86-64, unknown Linux GNU for glibc x86-64 Linux machine. You have three triplets when cross-compiling. When native compiling, all three are the same. When in cross-compiling, you have the built triplet, which uh, is the machine you are running. Then the host triplet, which uh, the resulting executables will run on. And the target triplet, which is in most cases, even with cross-compiling, same as the host triplet. But there's one special case in which it is separate. And it's when you are cross-compiling a cross-compiler. Say you are cross-compiling from x86-64, so that's your built triplet. You are cross-compiling a cross-compiler which will run on uh, PowerPC, so that's the host. And then you have the target, which is, for example, ARM. Um, as, but as I said, most of the time, host and target are the same, and this is a really specific niche case. With GCC, you have a separate cross-tool chain, which is a sort of a bundle of GCC, Ellipsc, and other stuff for each host. A uh, cross tool chain is installed in a sysroot, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, similar to the root file system of your Linux, except uh, for cross compiling. It contains uh, libraries and so on for the target you are compiling for. A cross compiler consists of bin utils, which provides the linker and assembler and some other basic utilities. You compile this first using your native compiler. Then you build a freestanding compiler, which would be GCC, uh, which is not using any libc headers and it uh, does not have support for anything other than C and C++. It's stripped down, uh, so it takes as little time as possible to compile. And of course, since you don't have the features available, uh, you want to reduce it, reduce it to a minimum you can use. In any case, the only purpose of this compiler is to build the libc, which is then needed to compile the final compiler, which will be installed into the sysroot with uh, the binutils and other stuff. That means you need to compile GCC for every target you, you are compiling for, and then use uh, the build system for the thing you are compiling to use a triplet prefix version of GCC executable. It's kind of complicated and of course it also uses a lot of resources to build the grass tool chain and uh, building GCC is not really an easy or uh, small task. It also requires specific integration into the build system. So can we make this better in some way? Well with LLVM you have just one compiler for everything. You can use the same clang you are using to build native executables to also cross build for any target. Of course, uh, even though the compiler is actually capable of matting the code, you still need a cross tool chain of a sort because uh, you do not have the runtime uh, for C and C++ and the built-ins available at this point. This is slightly tricky to build because uh, you do not have a sysroot populated yet and compiler-rt needs libc headers to build. In most distributions, uh, this is actually solved because you can just use the GCC built uh, uh, Sysroot to, you know, compile, compile RT and other stuff. In our case, we cannot do this. So what we do is uh, first uh, install only headers of uh, the muscle libc into the Sysroot. Well, actually only into a temporary directory during intermediate build. Once we have the headers, uh, it's possible to build compile RT. You have to tell CMake to only attempt static libraries, because if you don't, it will try to run executables and this will fail because uh, you do not have the runtime at all. Once you have built the core bits, uh, you do not care about sanitizers or anything yet, you only build really the core built-ins library. You add this into the sysroot and then you can build muscle. Once you have muscle, you basically have uh, what you need to compile simple C executables. 
but you still need lib unwind, which you have to compile with unwind lib none, because you don't have it yet. And you need a C++ library, so you first build lib C++ ABI with the no std lib flag and CXS flags, because you don't have standard library yet. And then you build lib C++ itself with the same CXS flags. Once you have this, your runtime is basically complete. But uh, if you want sanitizers, you also have to build the rest of compiler RT. This time you skip the build and you just compile the rest of uh, the more advanced stuff. Then uh, it's really complete and you only have to tell Clang the target you are compiling for, as well as uh, point it to the sysroot, which then uh, this compiler can prefix uh, things like include paths with. Since uh, it does not really take a long time to build the runtimes, and it's, it would be a shame to have to duplicate the packaging for every single architecture, we actually built all of them at once, and then split them by sub packages. As far as integration into CBuild goes, there's a separate specification of uh, host and target dependencies, with the host dependencies containing things like build system and other tooling which needs to be run. And as well as the cross tool chain, they are installed normally just like uh, during native builds. Then you have target dependencies which are installed with apk into the sysroot when cross compiling. On native compiling, they are installed together with host dependencies uh, just uh, in a no normal way. You treat the cross sysroot as the target apk sysroot, uh, but there's a minor thing to solve. That is, uh, the cross tool chain provides some files which the APK could actually overwrite. So, in order to prevent APK from overwriting those files, we have the sysroot contain APK database uh, providing a dummy based package by default, which uh, only provides some virtual packages to ensure that uh, APK does not overwrite anything because it thinks it's already installed. In theory, that is really everything you need. In practice, uh, you need a uh, various uh, cross workaround for different build systems. CBuild already provides utility modules to treat uh, uh, several common build systems, so it contains those workarounds for cross compiling by default. And for most software, this works okay. In some software, you still need separate workarounds because you know different things have different build systems, and not everything is the same. The system also takes care of uh, ensuring that correct C flags are exported for every target and there's also a complete API for handling build profiles, which you can treat like objects in your Python build templates and actually, you know, uh, have every single target registered with C build uh, available if you need it. It's a very simple and flexible API. But how about improving C build a bit more? Well, the first thing I did was uh, ensuring that unit tests for everything run out of bugs. This was not done during early development because it would get in the way too much uh, with the pace I was refactoring at. But uh, as things slow down a bit, uh, it's good to run unit tests for everything and ensure they pass because uh, it might help catch uh, you know different bugs which might not show up during build. Something might build fine, but it, then it might crash. Uh, Unit tests are not run for cross compiling because it's not possible to do so. I also greatly improved the sandbox with network access now being disabled after the fetch stage. The build system has several stages. The fetch stage takes care of downloading everything from the internet and uh, then you then the system makes sure that nothing no other stage can actually access the network. Uh, then uh, I also made sure that uh, the container in which uh, things are built is treated as read-only, except the actual build direct directory, as well as the destination directory and temporary directory, which is cleaned up, is uh, just a temporary file system. Uh, this ensures that uh, the container remains consistent. Uh, you, you can be sure that uh, the build will not modify it in some way which is unintended. The container environment is therefore fully sanitized, and we also take care to prevent breakout of the outside system by limiting what is mounted into the container. And of course, uh, different things are mounted depending on the stage, so nothing can really access, uh, for example, some uh, bad build could access sign-in keys or mess up uh, your outer file system in some way. So this really is for both safety and security.
<coughs> now first boot. <coughs> this is what things looked like when I first booted the system. It was a simple QMU run with uh, just a serial console and nothing else. But it was something at first. This was done in early October and uh, there was the Linux kernel 5.14, later updated to 5.15. This needed some build workarounds because uh, the kernel build system likes to assume GNU tools such as uh, speci specific GNU features in SED. So I worked around these and eventually managed to build the kernel. Then I added the init system and set it up. Setting it up involved uh, creating the core services suite which is specific to Chimera and cannot be shared by upstream. Uh, unfortunately this is not fully documented but uh, it does work for now at least. I also added a generator for initial RAM disk images for the kernel. I used uh, initram MFS tools from Debian which is surprisingly nice and easy to work. I used it because it's small and modular. And also, it's written in POSIX shell, unlike alternatives which uh, are usually written in bash, for example, Dracut. We do not have bash in the core system, so it's impossible to use something which uh, would require it. So I used in terms of tools and it, it was a really nice experience. I like it a whole, more, a whole lot more than Dracut. As far as the graphical system goes, uh, the packaging pace has increased greatly but, and by early November I had the Western Wayland compositor available. Uh, it also started showing that uh, this might not be sustainable and it is impossible to actually check uh, for ups every single upstream for updates uh, as one person, so I added update check. What is update check? Well, it's a simple tool which integrates with the build templates of CBuild. It checks the URL as well as the source URLs uh, for upstream uh, versions. And it will give you a nice summary of if uh, your package is, up, is out of date or if it needs updating in some way. Well, this uh, is automatic for most things, especially with many projects nowadays using uh, the likes of GitHub and GitLab. But uh, if, uh, if something is impossible to verify automatically, you can still specify the custom URL to check, as well as the pattern to find uh, to match for versions. This uh, works much better than I initially expected, and we now have uh, every single package uh, having functional update check, and you can actually easily check uh, upstream if, uh, if you need to update this thing. And yes, it runs Doom. This was achieved in early December. It's a major milestone for the project because, you know, every computer-like thing needs to be able to run Doom. While at this, I also turned on system-wide LTO, which worked much better than I thought. Also, we needed bootloader, so I added grab. The reason I added grab was because it's universal and works for every target. Uh, well, you can boot the system in other ways, for example with FA you can use FA stub and the likes of that, but uh, for most uh, other platforms you need some kind of bootloader, so grub was a good fit. I also added the Pipewire sound server because while testing Doom I noticed that uh, uh, there was no audio and I couldn't listen to that E1M1, so uh, I added Pipewire and then things just worked. Uh, this showed another problem, and that is uh, how to actually launch Pipewire in a reasonable way. Well, uh, the answer to that is user services. How does this work? There's a daemon running as a system service which takes care of uh, spawning and supervising those user instances of uh, Dinit. Uh, this daemon is notified of new logins and logouts via a special PAM module. Uh, packages can install user services in system paths and then uh, users can actually enable them. Uh, they can of course also have custom service files in their home directories, uh, but uh, system packages can install new user services and those can be easily enabled. What is managed through this system right now is the dbus session bus. That means it's no longer spawned uh, in an ad hoc manner like in most pre-system D distributions. Uh, it's actually reliable and you can actually rely on uh, having a consistent path for its listening socket and so on. Also, uh, Pipewire and WirePlumber are both uh, spawned through user service. 
This will be expanded in the future and a lot more things are going to use it. Now X.org, uh, this is the Enlightenment desktop running on X.org in Chimera. I added X.org in mid-December. It was just a lot of boring packaging, so I will not elaborate on that too much. Uh, I also added uh, some window managers, notably PackWM at first and then Enlightenment and its EFL toolkit. And that remind me, I will probably need the GTK toolkit, so I also added the GTK toolkit. And one thing I ran into while packaging GTK was that GTK nowadays relies a lot on scalable icons uh, in the SVG format, and for this it needs the Lipar SVG library. Uh, Lipar SVG is written in Rust language, so we need the Rust toolchain. Rust is kind of a pain to deal with because uh, it's difficult to bootstrap, it's difficult to cross compile, it uh, does not have any good way to bootstrap from source. Uh, so uh, I was kind of saved by uh, there being official binaries for x86-64 for muscle, and those sort of worked. I say sort of because uh, they do not work out of the box. They depend on libgccs, and I worked around this by just symlinking it to libunwinder. So. This was enough to let the compiler run and recompile itself for our environment. Of course, just like every major Linux uh, distro using muscle, uh, some patching was needed for, mus for, for this and I also needed to add more patches to deal with our client only environment. Also, while at uh, patching, I added uh, custom vendor triplets into, into the Rust build so we could use the same ones as for Clang. I then generated custom bootstrap binaries uh, for Rust, which would no longer have these drawbacks, and cross-compiled for PPC64 LE and for ARCH64. Then I had bootstrap binaries for these three architectures, and I bootstrapped natively on all of these. Other architectures, such as RISC-V and BigNDN64 bit PowerPC, will be added later and they can be cross-compiled in the same manner. I did a special cross-compiling mode into the packaging, uh, or special bootstrap mode into the packaging, which uh, takes care of automatically generating those uh, bootstrap tarballs for you, because it's a pain to do by hand, and if I can automate it, uh, it's only a good thing. Now, multimedia. This is uh, the Blender Big Bug Bunny movie uh, actually working on Chimera without any frame drops or any rendering issues. So I made this just before the year ended, uh, it was commented on 31st December and it was a complete build of FFmpeg and most of its dependencies. This build is really comparable to most other distributions, it has all the features like uh, uh, AV1 codec support through David and libaom. Uh, libvpx, uh, x264, x265 on you know all these things. Uh, I also added the MPV media player. This means uh, it's almost a usable desktop system. I mean, what else do you need? Well, basically every every system nowadays needs a web browser. I already had a web browser in form of links, but that's uh, not something you would actually use with modern websites. So we needed a proper big web browser. But before packaging a browser, I decided to upgrade OpenSSL. I was previously using OpenSSL 1.1 branch, and I went uh, straight to 3.0.1. This was slightly problematic because uh, uh, they changed some APIs as well as uh, made uh, sure that some legacy cryptographic algorithms are not actually available by default nowadays, and if something expects these, uh, you have to use the provider API to actually load the legacy provider and this is not uh, really suitable for everything yet. But I managed to work around all of the issues and eventually I had OpenSSL 3. The reason I updated at this point is because uh, OpenSSL 1 has some uh, real licensing problems. It's dual licensed under the OpenSSL license and the BSD4 clause license. The OpenSSL license is basically uh, Apache license 1, and neither of those two licenses are actually GPL compatible, which creates major legal pains when it comes to combining with GPL works, especially things like FFmpeg, which is GPL licensed if you have uh, all the filters uh, available. 
So OpenSSL3 solves this by relicensing the whole thing to Apache License 2. And that solves it because Apache License 2 is compatible with GPL3. And then for every project which uh, either uses GPL3 or has the GPL2 or later um, clause, actually it's legally compatible. I also started packaging initial pieces of GNOME. During this I packaged WebKit GTK and its dependencies. This was mostly just boring packaging again, so there's no point in talking much about it. But eventually I packaged also the GNOME AppFinny browser, also called GNOME Web. And at this point the template count was uh, some 500 or more. The actual package count is actually much higher, because uh, we have sub packages for things like development files, so the actual number is more like <coughs> triple this number. And here it is, uh, the Epiphany browser fully running without any rendering problems or uh, any other problems. Uh, it's still in the Enlightenment uh, desktop. I would like to package GNOME later, but more about that later. In the future, um, well I've already described everything uh, when it comes to progress until now, so there's nothing much else to talk about. But uh, in the future I would like to migrate to APK Tools 3, which should come around May or so, and uh, it brings a completely new package format. That's why I'm waiting uh, with when it comes to releasing official repositories and setting up some kind of CI and so on, because uh, I would have to handle some uh, transition path from the old format to the new format. If I wait, uh, this will be avoided and I can use the time I have to improve the packaging as much as possible so it is uh, ready uh, for production and does not have to be modified extensively later. Also packaging the GNOME desktop is a goal and I would like to package at least the core of it uh, so you can uh, you know, bring up a desktop session and, and use it. Uh, it does not have to package all applications in the main repo. Also extending the user services framework is a major goal and also migrating my own system to it. Because if I migrate my own systems, then I can uh, expose uh, issues faster and, you know, duck footing is important. Also, when it comes to more low-level things, improving system documentation is an important goal. I should write manual pages for, say, the service management framework, which is Chimera-specific, and uh, I should also harden the binaries a bit more. This will involve enabling undefined behavior sanitizer on all targets, as well as Splink CFI on uh, targets which support it, which is currently, unfortunately, only x86-64 and uh, arch64. There's also a Fortify source, which is enabled in Seabuild, but there's no headers to provide the Fortified implementations of uh, standard functions. There's the standalone Fortify headers project, which is used by Alpine Linux, but uh, it's not suitable for us because it makes some uh, sketchy GCC specific assumptions and does not actually work with, uh, with a client toolchain. There's also locales, which currently only exist as empty implementations in the muscle libc. I would like to provide a third party solution providing actual uh, proper locale support so people can have localized uh, dates and currency formats and things like that without only having uh, basic translations. When it comes to login tracking via UTMP and WTMP, this is the same story and it's only empty implementations in Muscle, so I would like to eventually provide a third party solution to this. In any case, thank you for listening, and if you want to get involved or just want to check it out, and there's the link to our website, as well as the link to our GitHub organization. And we also have a chat channels at uh, IRC, at OFTC, uh, and also the Matrix channel, which is linked to the IRC channel. So whichever you prefer, you can join either one and actually talk to the same people. In any case, thank you and see you over there.